Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be part 5 of The Volpine Huntsman of Vale. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 12 to 14. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. Ashbin sat in his office late Friday night, waiting for the two staff members he had summoned to report in. One of them was to receive special orders, and one was to deliver the results of special orders that he had received earlier that day. Their orders were very different. In fact, there was only really one similarity between the two sets of instructions. They both had to do with a student named Uzumaki Naruto. As Ashbin took a sip of tea out of his mug, the door to his office opened, and Professor Kerala Lingwam walked into the room. You wanted to see me, headmaster? Ashbin set his mug down and smiled at the woman who had just entered his office. Indeed I did. Please, have a seat. He gestured to the chair in front of his desk, and the professor of linguistics sat down. Now, you're probably wondering why I've called you in here, so I'll explain, Ashbin said. I have a slightly unusual task that I would like you to be in charge of. Have you heard of a student here named Uzumaki Naruto? Professor Lingwam nodded. I've heard from Peter and Felicia that he's quite powerful for being a first-year student. Supposedly, he can conjure up dragons made of the forces of nature's wrath. She smirked. Although that might have been Peter's unique style of storytelling rearing its head, the headmaster couldn't help but smirk as well. As much as Peter is known for embellishment, I have to say that in this case, it is entirely true. Professor Lingwam's eyes widened at this. I have watched him call up dragons of fire and wind myself. Amazing! She breathed. And the stories that he does all of this without dust? Ashbin simply nodded, causing the woman another bout of surprise. That is directly related to the reason why I've asked you to accept this task. Mr. Uzumaki has hinted strongly that it is his semblance that allows him to command nature's wrath like he does. However, he has an unusually varied set of abilities and applies them in unique ways. Particularly, he often declares aloud the names of specific attacks. Even more unusual, he shouts them not in English, but in Japanese. A look of understanding came across Professor Lingwam's face. And you would like me to translate them? Ashbin smiled and nodded. He opened a drawer of his desk and withdrew a small data strip. He held it out to the professor, and she took it and put it in her pocket. On that data strip is several recordings of Mr. Uzumaki calling out the names of his techniques. I would appreciate it if you would translate that into English, as well as any other recordings I might give you in the future. In addition, any insights about the phrasing of or background behind the names of his techniques would be most welcome. She nodded to him and said, that shouldn't be a problem. Depending on the number of different techniques, I should be able to get the translations back to you either tomorrow or the day after. Will that be all? Yes. Thank you for your help. After Professor Lingwam departed, Ashbin had to wait an additional 17 minutes before his second order of business could be concluded. When Professor Dirge Fessig walked into the office, the headmaster leaned forward in anticipation of the news he would be bringing. The professor in question scratched at his thick beard as he walked into the room and walked up to Ashbin's desk. Without prompting, he pulled a small object out of his pocket and placed it gently on Ashbin's desk. Well, I got it done. Wasn't easy, given what little I had to work with. Most of it was contaminated by the time I got the orders. What you've got in that vial is all that was left after it was finished being purified. It's stable now and I made sure that it won't decay or go bad before you run whatever tests you need done on it. Thank you, Ashbin said. That will be all. Have a nice weekend. Professor Fessig nodded and left Ashbin's office. The headmaster gently picked up the vial and raised it to eye level to examine it. Perhaps this will allow me to move forward in this matter. Inside of that vial was a few millimeters of blood. The following morning, having disabled his alarm the night before, Naruto had plans to sleep in a bit on Saturday. He should have known that things would turn out differently. Naruto was awoken by a thump followed by a gasp of pain, and he opened his eyes to see Ruby crouched on the floor next to his bed. Her own bed was swinging slightly back and forth, which allowed him to draw the conclusion that she had jumped down from her own bed instead of climbing down. Her hand grasped her right leg, where one of Weiss's ice spikes had hit her the previous day. With a glance at the clock and at his other two teammates, Naruto saw that it was 8.30 in the morning, and he and Ruby were the only two awake. Ruby began to stand up, and Naruto quickly pushed his covers off of him and got up as well. Hey, you all right? He whispered. As his eyes focused properly on her, he noticed some bruising on her shoulders and back, where her tank top didn't cover. 
Her red cloak may have stopped the ice from piercing her skin, but from the looks of it, it didn't protect her completely. She jumped slightly and turned around when Naruto spoke, but remained quiet so as not to wake their teammates. Yeah, I'm fine, she whispered back. Just a little sore from yesterday, I guess. You sure? Naruto asked. From the sound of it, your leg isn't healed up completely, and you've got some bruises on your back as well. I'm sure, Ruby confirmed. I'm just a little stiff. I'll be fine in a bit. She raised her arms over her head and went to stretch, but flinched as the muscles in her shoulders burned in protest. With a raised eyebrow, Naruto said, Yeah, sure. Ruby stopped trying to stretch and looked sheepish. Sit down. I think I might be able to help you with that stiffness a bit. He gestured to his bed. Ruby hesitated for a moment, her cheeks turning a light pink, before nodding and sitting down on the edge of Naruto's bed. Naruto got on his bed as well and knelt directly behind her. Ruby turned her head to try and see what he was doing, but he gently stopped her by putting his hand on the side of her head. Don't twist yourself up while I'm doing this. That definitely won't help your stiffness at all. Her cheeks now sporting a distinct red tint, Ruby faced forward again. Okay, she whispered. Naruto breathed in and exhaled, then focused on his chakra. What he was about to do was something he had named chakra massage. It was actually the result of failed attempts to reverse engineer Irio ninjutsu, medical ninjutsu. Over the course of nearly six months, he had found, much to his frustration, that despite his improved chakra control from a great deal of practice, he still couldn't manage to figure out even the simplest of proper Irio ninjutsu. Thankfully, his efforts hadn't been a complete waste. He brought his hands together behind Ruby's back and formed a Hitsuji seal, followed by Na, then Inu, and a second Hitsuji. Immediately after completing the fourth seal, he clapped his hands together gently and rubbed them together. The palms of his hands and the tips of his fingers began to glow the light blue color of his chakra, and he placed his hands on Ruby's shoulders. Unnoticed by Ruby and Naruto, Blake's eyes had eased open as soon as Naruto's hands had begun to glow and those two amber orbs focused their attention on the R and U of Team Ruby. Once Naruto's hands had settled on Ruby's shoulders, the blue glow began to fade. This was immediately followed by a gasp from Ruby, as the most amazing feeling began to spread through her shoulders. It felt like a wave of warmth passing slowly through her flesh, tugging gently on her muscles in all of the right ways as it went by. It was infinitely better than a massage, and she immediately felt the tension in her muscles begin to abate. Naruto smirked at Ruby's gasp, knowing that the chakra massage had begun to take effect. However, he didn't expect the soft hum of pleasure that came next. Mm mm, ah, uh, what exactly is this, Naruto? With a smile, Naruto leaned in closer to her ear and whispered, It's something I developed in an attempt to create a technique that would allow me to heal others. Essentially, I'm pushing energy through your skin and muscles, which pushes lactic acid out of them and forces them to relax. Even though I didn't manage to perfect the technique, I've theorized that some of my healing potential could be shared with someone else as long as I'm doing this to them. He pushed the last of the gathered chakra out of his hands, and the glow faded completely. Taking his hands off of her shoulders, he said, I'd actually appreciate it if you let me know how much this ends up helping. I've only tested it on myself before, and with the way I heal, that's not exactly a good test for it. Ruby nodded and rolled her shoulders. Yeah, sure. It's the least I can do. It feels great so far. Naruto nodded and wove the four seals again. Hitsuji to draw out chakra in as malleable a form as possible. Na and Inu to shift the nature of the chakra toward Irio chakra and Hitsuji again to make the chakra even more fluid and moldable. Naruto went to place his hands on Ruby's back, but with her sitting and him kneeling, it gave him an awkward angle to work with. He paused for a moment to think before saying, Hey, Ruby, you mind lying down on your stomach for this one? It'll give me a better angle to work with. A little apprehensive at the idea of lying down in a boy's bed, especially when the boy in question was on the bed as well, Ruby blushed again, but agreed. All right. Naruto backed up to give her room to get comfortable, and once she had settled into a prone position, he sat next to her and redid the seals to refresh the chakra. Blake's bow twitched as Naruto placed his left hand between Ruby's shoulder blades and his right on the small of her back. The glow of his hands began to fade for a second time and Ruby had to bite down on her lip to stop herself from moaning out loud. As it was, she made an interesting oh -m 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 noise and her face went red. Even Naruto's cheeks turned pink at the noise that Ruby had made. Hey, try to keep quiet. The others are still sleeping. The only response he got was, you, m -m -m -m, which could have been intended to be an aha, uh -huh, 
or it could have just been another suppressed moan. After another twenty seconds or so, Ruby's fists gripped fistfuls of sheets and her back began to arch with pleasure, and Blake began to wonder if Naruto had been reading a Ninjas of Love book while he was attempting to develop his failed technique. This definitely seemed like something that might be included in her favorite books. An additional thirty seconds passed before the glow in Naruto's hands faded completely and Ruby went limp, humming in contentment. Naruto scratched the back of his head as he observed Ruby's response to the chakra massage. Mao! This kind of effect was unexpected. He then shrugged and touched Ruby gently on the shoulder to get her attention. Ruby, if it's alright with you, I'm going to take a look at the wounds on your leg, okay? Ruby made another interesting noise before rolling herself over and propping herself up on her elbows. With a push on the bed, she brought herself into a seated position, with her legs straight out in front of her, her back propped up against the wall behind the top of the bed. She reached down and rolled up the right leg of her pajama pants up to the knee, exposing both of the spots where the largest ice spikes had hit her. With a gentle grip, Naruto lifted her calf up into the air to get a better look at the wounds. He unwound the bandaging that Ruby had put back on her leg after her shower the previous night and looked at the partially healed skin underneath. Aura, despite its many miraculous properties, couldn't usually heal wounds completely. It was very good at stopping bleeding and patching wounds up so that you could still function, but except for small wounds and bruises, it was rare for someone to have the raw aura required for a complete fix. Ruby's wounds really didn't have any chance for complete healing to begin with, since she was already not at peak condition when she got them. The puncture wounds had managed to scab over completely in the time since the match, but they were swollen a little, from the body's natural response to any wound. Naruto gently pressed near the wounds with his fingers, and he could tell from Ruby's reaction that they were still sore. He could also feel the tensed and knotted muscles around them. He slowly placed Ruby's leg back down and said, let's see how well this works on actual wounds. With that, he ran through the four seals again. Ruby looked at his hands with curiosity and a little awe as they began to glow a light blue. Naruto gently slid his hands onto Ruby's wounds and began to push Chakra through them. Ruby sighed in relief as the soreness and stiffness began to fade, and she smiled, glad that she had agreed to try this. As Naruto continued to pour Chakra into Ruby's leg, Ruby stared at Naruto's hands with curiosity. This time, the technique wasn't quite so overwhelming, probably due to the fact that it was on the lower half of her leg rather than her back and shoulders, so Ruby didn't even feel the urge to moan. After about 30 seconds of watching the glow slowly fade, she asked, why is it glowing blue? Naruto looked up at her in confusion. What? She gestured to his hands. Your hands. They're glowing blue. But wasn't your aura golden? That question made Naruto pause for a second, and he considered carefully how he should answer it. That's because it's chakra, not aura, definitely wasn't a valid option at this point. Maybe if he ever decided to reveal his true nature to his teammates. Well, Naruto began energy can be converted into all sorts of different forms. Those different forms have different properties, like color. Proper healing techniques are actually light green, but I'm not that great at controlling precise amounts of energy, and you need to be able to do that for healing techniques. So, since it's an imperfect technique, it's bluish. This answer satisfied Ruby, but something about Naruto's explanation seemed off to Blake. She couldn't quite put her finger on what it was, but she felt like he had dodged the question somehow, despite the fact that he had given a fairly straightforward answer. After a few minutes had passed, the last of the glow faded away, and Naruto took his hands off of the wounds. Once again, he gently lifted Ruby's leg up to get a better look at the injured area. The swelling and redness around the scabs was almost completely gone, and the scab looked about a day older than it had previously. Naruto nodded to himself in satisfaction and placed Ruby's leg back down. All right then, that's it for now. How do you feel? Ruby smiled, before getting up off of Naruto's bed and stretching. She let out another sigh of happiness and said, Much better, thanks. I feel almost as good as new. Almost? Naruto asked. This seemed to make Ruby embarrassed. Um, well, not to complain about it or anything, but my back still feels kind of bruised. Saw thee. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth and all. Naruto simply waved her concerns off. No, no, that's fine. I didn't expect it to miraculously heal you completely anyways. Like I said before, what I just did is actually a result of me failing to make a proper medical jutsu. I'm just glad it worked as well as it did. This made Ruby feel much better about admitting that she still wasn't at 100%. Okay then, thanks again for doing that for me. Naruto simply smiled at her and said, you're welcome. 
Anytime you're injured and want a bit of a boost, don't hesitate to ask. Ruby nodded and blushed slightly at the thought of going through such an enjoyable treatment again. All right, I'll let you know if I need some patching up. She walked over to her closet and grabbed a red t-shirt with a black rose design on it, as well as some jeans, and went into the bathroom to change. Blake quickly feigned being asleep the minute Ruby had begun to move. Naruto continued to smile as he laid back down in his bed, intent on getting a little more rest, even if it wasn't in the form of sleep. A minute or so later, and Ruby was back in the room, dressed in her outfit for the day. She walked over to her desk to grab her scroll and slipped it into her pocket and walked over to the door. She hesitated as she put her hand on the doorknob and turned back to look at Naruto. After a second or two, she let her hand fall from the doorknob and walked over to Naruto's bedside. She sat down on his desk chair and whispered, Hey, Naruto, you still awake? Naruto opened his eyes and looked at his team leader. Yeah, something you needed, he whispered back, sitting up and letting his legs hand off the edge of the bed. Well, Ruby hesitated again. I figured, since you apologized to the three of us yesterday, we kind owe you an apology too. This surprised Naruto, but Ruby continued before he could comment. We dredged up stuff from your past, and that obviously made you uncomfortable. That sort of started this whole thing, so it isn't fair to blame you completely. So sorry. Naruto blinked in further surprise, before smiling. Thanks, but you couldn't have known that bringing up my past would distress me. No apology necessary. Uh, okay. She paused for a moment. I still felt like I should though. I'm going to go get breakfast. Want to come with me? Naruto shook his head and lay back down. Not hungry yet. I still feel like resting. Ruby stood up, looking a little disappointed. Okay. See you later. Bye. After that, Ruby quietly exited the room, and Blake opened her eyes again to look at Naruto. His eyes were closed, so Blake decided that it was time for her to wake up. The rest of the weekend went fairly smoothly for Team Ruby. Yang avoided Naruto except when the entire team was present. Ruby had pretty much reverted immediately to how she was before the whole debacle, and Blake was as unreadable as usual. Naruto thought a few times about telling the three of them about being a Hanyu, though he might have to pass it off as being a Faunus for a while. However, he decided to wait until he was back in Yang's good graces, since a big reveal like that could have unforeseen consequences. On Sunday, Ruby insisted that the four of them would participate in the teamwork exercise that would be taking place on Monday to measure how much their practice sessions had helped their cohesion. Blake commented dryly that the results from only two practices probably wouldn't make a massive difference, but nobody else listened to her. After classes were done on Monday, Team Ruby gathered in their dorm room and prepared themselves to participate in the teamwork activity. Naruto put on his battle gear and double-checked to see if his thigh pouch had all of the supplies he needed. Blake did a similar check on her medical kit and slid a full magazine into Gamble Shroud. Yang loaded a belt of empty shells into Ember Celica and did a series of punches, running the shells through her weapon to make sure everything was in working order, before reloading with live rounds. Ruby had already done the checks on the firearm part of Crescent Rose, and was busy sharpening each of the seven blades that made up Crescent Rose's scythe and pommel. Ruby was the last to finish getting ready, since sharpening all of those parts was a time-consuming process, and the four of them walked together to the landing area where a bullhead was waiting. It felt good to Naruto to be walking alongside his teammates again, even if Yang made sure to put both Blake and Ruby between the two of them. Professor Goodwitch was already in the bullhead, and as Team Ruby boarded, she began to explain what they would be doing. This exercise will be similar to initiation. The four of you will be dropped into the Emerald Forest, and your job will be to make your way to the same temple where the relics were located. You will then secure the area so that the bullhead can land and pick you back up. Once again, your progress will be monitored, but this time, I will be giving you suggestions at the end of the exercise that should help you improve your teamwork and cohesion. Additionally, if you do end up encountering opposition that is beyond your ability to handle, I can choose to intervene if I fear you are in danger. Are the four of you ready? Goodwitch noted with some slight curiosity that while Blake and Yang gave her an affirmation directly, Naruto looked over at Ruby, who ended up looking over at him after he remained silent for a few seconds. Once they made eye contact, the blonde huntsman nodded to her before facing front again. Confused, Ruby turned back to Goodwitch and said, Uh, I guess all of us are ready then. Very well, the professor said. She pulled out her scroll and tapped its screen before saying, Take us up, pilot. The side door of the bullhead slowly shut, and a light came on in the room they were in. A few seconds after the door had closed, they felt the bullhead take off and begin to move forward, presumably in the direction of the Emerald Forest. After several minutes of flying, the bullhead slowed down, and the bay door opened again. 
all four members of Team Ruby could see the Relic Temple from their position, and they all noticed that their position was drastically different than their starting point during initiation. In fact, they were being dropped off in a section of the forest that was much higher than their target, causing there to be a sheer drop between their current position and the temple. You may jump when ready, Goodwitch announced. Ruby, in a display of the lead by example plan, leapt first. Naruto smirked and followed her, quickly followed by Blake and Yang. There were no birds to distract any of them this time, and they thankfully didn't drift very far from each other as they fell. The four of them landed with little issue, and quickly regrouped to begin moving through the forest. They didn't make it far before they met some company that their landing had attracted. A pack of eleven Bia wolves slunk out of the trees, and the four hunters readied their weapons. Ruby quickly called out, Team Petalstorm charge, Team Bumblebee follow, and cover our flanks. Ruby's spontaneous use of the informal team names from practice worked surprisingly well, as everyone knew what she meant instantly. She rushed forward. Naruto running next to her with a Rasengan in each hand. Blake and Yang paused for a moment to shoot some bullets at the Bio Wolves on the far left, and right before running after their teammates. Ruby and Naruto quickly dealt with the Bio Wolves directly in front of the group, while Blake kept the rest of the pack from attacking their right side, and Yang did the same on the left. The encounter was over in less than a minute, and Team Ruby quickly stowed their weapons away and moved on. There was very little opposition for the most part, as Team Ruby made their way through the forest. They met a few lone Bio wolves, which were handled with ease, and one angry Borbatusk, which Naruto took care of with relish, since he didn't need to worry about collateral damage out in the forest. His wind chakra enhanced, slash, easily liberated the Grimm's top half from its bottom. They stayed in a loose formation as they moved through the trees, with each of them about somewhere between 5 and 10 meters away from their nearest teammate. Naruto became nostalgic and a bit sad at the same time at its resemblance to the formation that the Sasuke retrieval squad had taken. Yang was up front as the heavy hitter, Ruby was immediately behind her so that orders could be easily relayed to the whole team, Blake was behind her, as her semblance let her propel herself in any direction that was needed, and Naruto brought up the rear to make sure that nothing snuck up behind them. Ruby had never ordered them into that formation, but the four of them seemed to naturally drift into those positions. After a while of walking, the four of them came into a clearing that extended all the way to the cliff that they would have to navigate down. They moved closer together so that they could communicate while remaining quiet. How do we want to handle this? Blake asked. We could just jump, you know, Yang said. After all, we've landed longer drops. Ruby considered it for a moment. Let's leave that as a last resort. We use our weapons to reduce our speed, and the noise might draw attention from more grim. Yang grunted in acquiescence, and Naruto spoke up. I have a jutsu. It uses wind to propel me in a direction of my choosing. I've only ever used it on myself, but it shouldn't be too hard to spread it between the whole team and have it slow our fall. Yeah, no. Yang said bluntly. We're not getting killed by you trying to experiment. Naruto shrugged. Eh, that's fine. Keep it in mind though. Before they could discuss things further, there was a rustling in the bushes behind them, and Team Ruby spun around to face the potential threat, drawing their weapons as they did so. Several Ursi emerged from the trees and sniffed in the direction of Team Ruby. It didn't take long before the Grim roared and began to charge toward the hunters. Ruby was just about to call out a strategy when another threat appeared in the form of a massive Taijutu. It, of course, made a beeline for Naruto. Oh, come on. Naruto griped as he charged a Rasengan in his right hand and drew a chakra conducting Kanai in his left. Naruto leapt onto the head of the Taijutu while his three teammates fought the Ursi that had come with the massive snake. He jabbed at the beast's eyes with his Kanai while he clung to its head with chakra and tried to get a good enough hold on it to drive the Rasengan into its brain. It took him a while, but he managed to gouge out one of the Taijutu's eyes and stabbed his kanai deep within the ruined flesh to give himself a proper grip. He pressed his Rasengan into the Grim, whose scales didn't hold up to the swirling chakra as well as the Deathstalkers, and within half a minute, he detonated the Rasengan inside of the beast's head, and it went limp underneath him. With a triumphant cry, Naruto leapt off of the Taijutu's corpse and drew Kitsune no Akari Midair. He landed on top of an Ursa and cleaved its head from its shoulders, riding the corpse down to a soft landing. Ah, this dumb snake won't be eating me today. Just then, the King Taijutu's second head burst out of the trees, causing the dead head to flop comically. It became much less funny when the massive serpent opened its mouth and lunged forward, closing its jaws around Naruto. Having seen Naruto recover from this kind of setback before, his teammates did not panic. Instead, they regrouped and attacked the living half of the King Taijutu together. 
Yang shot flares into its eyes to blind it, and Blake and Ruby moved forward simultaneously to slash at its face. It began to writhe in pain, and in its thrashing, it smacked its head into Yang, flinging her across the clearing toward the cliffside. Blake and Ruby were forced to ease off the attack on the King Taijutu when the surviving Ursi began to attack them. It didn't matter in the end, however, as the serpent's writhing only intensified. Within seconds, its side had exploded, spraying gore and liquids into the trees behind it. Seriously? Are you friggin' and kidding me? Naruto was not a happy camper. He quickly calmed himself down and shook off as much slime as he could on his way over to his teammates. They were preparing to make a charge on one of the Ursi when they heard a cry of, H-E-Y, a little help over here. They looked toward the sound of the voice to see Yang hanging on to the edge of the cliff. This on its own wouldn't be an issue, as Yang was more than strong enough to pull herself up. However, there was a slight complication in the form of an Ursa hovering above her, preparing to attack her if she should try to haul herself onto solid ground. Blake and Ruby ran for the edge of the cliff as fast as they could, and Naruto snapped his hands into a Hitsuji seal to perform a Shunshin no Jutsu, body flicker Jutsu. Just as Naruto appeared, the Ursa slashed down at Yang, forcing her to drop down lower to avoid it. Unfortunately for her, she dropped onto an unstable handhold, and as Naruto sliced the head off of the Ursa from behind, the rock in her hand crumbled, and she began to fall, spinning out of control when she bounced off of an outcropping of the cliff. Naruto sheathed Kitsu no Akari and immediately jumped after her, with Ruby calling out, YNG, behind him. As he began to fall, he formed his classic cross-shaped seal and cried out, Kinjutsu, Tajuka Bunshin, Forbidden Art, Mass Shadow Replication. Blake gasped as nearly 40 copies of Naruto formed on the cliffside and began to jump off as well, grabbing the ankles of the clone ahead of them as they did so. Kinjutsu, she whispered to herself. Meanwhile, Naruto's head was swimming. He had forgotten the kind of effect pushing his limits with the Taju Kage Bunshin no Jutsu, mass shadow replication technique, could have, especially after the alterations he had made to his Kage Bunshin. He called out Yang, grab onto me, as he made out a splash of yellow in front of him, and the blonde brawler turned her head and gaped for a moment at the chain of Naruto's above her before reaching out to the original. Naruto also extended his hands, and he and Yang grabbed each other's arms. Soon after that, they began to slow down before jolting to a stop and swinging toward the cliffs. Naruto shook off the most of the disorientation and prepared for impact. It was a fairly simple matter for Naruto to stick himself to the cliffs while keeping a hold on Yang, and she quickly found handholds and footholds to begin climbing. Naruto dismissed the Kage Bunshin that had been part of the chain and stayed by Yang as she made her way downwards. She refused any offer of help from him, and he didn't want to risk getting punched off of the cliff if he insisted, but he wasn't going to just abandon her in such a tenuous position. One of his clones had informed Ruby and Blake that Yang was safe and sound, and between the two huntresses and the four clones that hadn't jumped off of the cliff, the last of the Ursi were quickly killed. The rest of the clones dispelled themselves, and Blake and Ruby descended the cliff in a much more controlled fashion than Yang's original plummet. Blake and Ruby arrived at the bottom of the cliff to find Yang crossing her arms and resolutely facing away from Naruto, who was looking at her with a raised eyebrow. They stood there for a moment in silence before Yang turned her head slightly in Naruto's direction. I could have taken care of myself, you know? You didn't have to do something as stupid as jumping off a cliff after me. Naruto decided not to respond to that right away, as he likely would have said something to irritate the hot-tempered girl. Still, thanks for the thought I guess. She began to walk in the direction of the forest temple. Ruby and Blake followed soon after her. Ruby smiled at Naruto as she walked past him. Blake, on the other hand, refused to even meet his eyes for some reason. Naruto shook off his confusion at Blake's reaction and smiled before following after his three teammates. Thankfully for Team Ruby, the rest of their journey was made with a complete absence of grim in any size, shape, or form. They made their way to the temple without any more issues, and were quickly picked up by the bullhead after doing a short sweep of the area. You work together well for a fresh team, Professor Goodwitch commented as they flew back to Beacon. Although you still have not done many collaborated attacks on a single target, your division of combat between multiple enemies is very well executed and yields good results for the most part. The teamwork that you did show when attacking one opponent was about average for a first-year group. I would recommend working on combining your attacks into larger single assaults, rather than multiple separate attacks. You'll need both in the field, but you already do the latter well enough, while the former is lacking. She continued to offer advice and recommendations, frequently referencing specific moments during their journey that day for more specific instructions. 
By the time they had landed back at the school's airstrip, they all had several things that they knew they needed to work on when they trained. Team Ruby stopped at the cafeteria on their way back to the dorm rooms to eat dinner together. After the day they had, they were in need of some good food. During the meal, Naruto noticed that Blake kept looking at him oddly, as though she was suspicious of him or something. Naruto tried to remember if he had done any pranks recently that had affected Blake in any way, but he couldn't think of anything he had done since he had come to Beacon. After the four of them made it back to their dorm room, they began to stow away their weapons and get cleaned up from their venture through the Emerald Forest. Ruby considered asking Naruto to use whatever glowy hand magic that he had done before for a second time, but decided that her minor soreness didn't warrant a request for him to use his abilities. It was nearly 10 o'clock when the four of them finished getting into comfortable attire and started to relax. When Naruto sat down at his desk and was preparing to get his few injutsu supplies out to work on one of his seals, he was interrupted by Blake saying, Naruto. He turned to face her, and he saw that she had fixed an intense gaze on him again. We need to talk. For a moment, Naruto almost smirked as he was struck by a sense of deja vu, but restrained himself due to Blake's serious expression. Okay, what about? Ruby and Yang both looked over at Blake as well, curious as to what their teammate could need to talk to Naruto about that would make her have such a serious expression. Blake stared at Naruto for several seconds before saying, I wanted to give you a chance to explain yourself before I brought it up in public, where a professor was likely to hear. These words didn't make Naruto any more relaxed about the conversation. So, do you want to tell our teammates what a kinjutsu is, or do you want me to? Naruto's eyes widened. Ah, shit. Kinjutsu? Ruby asked. What's that? She glanced back and forth several times between Blake and Naruto. Blake glanced at her before returning her gaze to Naruto and said, It means, literally, forbidden art. Why that particular technique is forbidden, I don't know, but I don't think one calls a technique kinjutsu lightly. Yang and Ruby looked at Naruto with surprise. Forbidden art? Yang asked it. I didn't even know they had those. Naruto sighed and said, Look, it's not as bad as you think. Kinjutsu, they're not technically illegal. At least, they're not illegal to use. This made Blake raise an eyebrow. But, if they're not illegal to use, then why call them forbidden at all? Ruby asked. Well, they are illegal to learn or teach without special authorization, and they are called forbidden because they are more dangerous than normal jutsu, Naruto admitted. There are a few kinjutsu that are illegal to use as well, but Taju Kage Bunshin isn't one of them. Yang crossed her arms, looking skeptical. That doesn't make any sense. Why would making copies of yourself be more dangerous than any of your other magic stuff? I'd like to know that as well, Blake added. My own shadow clones that I create with my semblance aren't dangerous at all. Is it because yours are more permanent? Naruto took a deep breath and let it out slowly. He remained silent for a moment, and his three teammates kept their eyes on him as he thought about how to answer. Most kinjutsu aren't declared kinjutsu for the harm they can do to their target. Although, there are some of those. The majority are declared forbidden because they put the user of the jutsu at great risk. Those words took a moment to sink in, and when they did, Ruby burst out, Wait, you're saying that using that jutsu puts you in danger? How? It just makes copies of you, right? Naruto smirked. The normal shadow clone technique is fairly simple once you get the hang of it. To produce multiple shadow clones, however, is far more complicated. Most jutsu take up a fixed amount of energy, or the user decides how much to put into the technique. To die from one of those jutsu, I would have to be foolish in my estimation of my stamina. Tajukage Bunshin. However, the amount of energy put into the technique simply determines how many clones to create. After they are created, the user's remaining energy is divided equally among him and all of the clones created. Thus, it is almost impossible to determine how much energy the technique will take for any significant number of clones, making it far more likely for me to use up all of my strength and die in the attempt. There was a sharp intake of breath from all three of his teammates at this, and Yang said, You? You risked killing yourself just to go after me? What the hell, Whiskers? We got launched off a massive cliff during initiation and I was fine then. Didn't you think I could handle myself? Her fists were clenched as if she was getting ready to punch her teammate for his foolishness. To be honest, Young, I didn't think much at all before I did it. That's a maneuver that I've done before, and the instant you went over the cliff, I acted on instinct. Besides, I'm a master of that particular kinjutsu. I was in little danger of dying from it. Young was silent for a moment before breaking eye contact with Naruto and grumbling, Damn idiot. If you do something stupid like that again, I'll break both of your arms. Naruto shrugged. With the way he healed, that wasn't actually that bad of a threat. I'll keep it in mind. 
Hold on. You said before that Kenjutsu are forbidden to learn or teach. Yet you just said that you're a master of it. How did you learn that one then? Beyond that, how did you master it? Blake asked. To the great surprise of his teammates, Naruto cringed noticeably in response to that question. That is a long story. I'd rather not go into it just now. He looked down at the floor. Blake looked like she wanted to insist that he explain, but Ruby spoke up before she could say anything. That's fine. If you don't want to talk about it, we understand. Just be careful using that jutsu, okay? Naruto looked up, meeting Ruby's eyes, and smiled when he saw her concerned look for him. Yeah, I'll be careful. Kagabunshin is the jutsu I'm best at after all, and it would be embarrassing to die making a mistake with my best technique. Young Skofet. You'd think not dying would be more motivating to not mess around than the risk of embarrassment. Dumbass. She turned away from him and walked over to his desk. She used it as a step up to climb into her bed and pulled the covers over herself. Her back turned to Naruto. Blake, whose gaze had followed Yang's movement, returned to Naruto. So, you're sure no SWAT team is going to swoop down on us to arrest you because of that jutsu? Naruto nodded. Absolutely sure. Even the people who decided to make that particular technique forbidden won't bug us about it. Good. Um, I guess I should apologize for jumping to conclusions then, Blake said. So sorry. Naruto just shrugged. It's no big deal. At least you asked me about it instead of just freaking out. He thought of several times that Sakura had jumped to conclusions hastily in the past and absent-mindedly rubbed the back of his head, where she would most often hit him. Definitely an improvement. He mumbled absent-mindedly. After a few more minutes of idle conversation, the three teammates who were still up bid each other a good night and got into their own beds. It wasn't long before all four of them were slumbering peacefully. Professor Ashbin, world-renowned S-class hunter and headmaster of Beacon Academy, rarely came across things that truly shocked him. True, he often was surprised in his everyday life. But the road of life always has little bumps and divots to navigate. With the amount of experience Ashbin had, however, it took something truly extraordinary to shake the foundations of what he knew to be true. Or rather, what he thought to be true. Currently sitting on his desk in front of him were two reports. Just from looking at them, someone would never guess that they were something special. In fact, they were both extremely brief, one being just a single page, and the other being only around half the thickness of an average mission report. Yet, despite their mundane appearances, one of these two reports had set Ashbin's mind reeling to a degree that he had never experienced before. Outwardly, he appeared perfectly calm, but within, he was completely at a loss as to how he should handle what the report in front of him implied. For the sake of forward progress, Ashbin decided to handle the two reports one at a time, and picked up the single-page report first, as it was the less vexing issue at the moment. It was a simple list of all of the Japanese terms that Naruto had been recorded using and their translations. A few of them had short notes with the pertinent information he had asked Professor Lingwam for. Obviously, the majority of the items on that list were technique names. Spiraling Sphere, Great Wind Dragon, Great Fire Dragon, Rising Sun Dragons, Stone Pillars, Double Shadow Clone, Hiding Like a Mole, Electromagnetic Murder. Ashbin paused at that translation, his eyebrows furrowed slightly with mild concern, before he remembered that Naruto had used that particular technique during the placement fights, and no serious harm had been done to Indigo Onda. The name of the technique was obviously a bit of an exaggeration. Either that, or Naruto hadn't quite mastered it yet. Deciding to ignore that last, slightly disturbing, possibility, Ashbin continued to move down the list, until he came to one particular entry. Katon, Ozenka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Art of the Phoenix Flower. An interesting note on the name of this technique. While there are several credible sources that list Phoenix Flower as the proper translation of Hozenka, there are no records of such a flower ever existing nor is there any legend or folktale that references any mythical phoenix flower. In fact, there are no indications as to the origins of the term Hozenka in Japanese. The note that accompanied the translation honestly wasn't even a serious issue. It simply piqued Ashbin's curiosity. Why name a technique after a flower that didn't even exist in the first place? Ashbin was of the opinion that the term likely drew its origins from the technique that Naruto had used, rather than the other way around, but he had no real proof of that and he wasn't likely to get a definitive answer anyway. Ashbin set the paper back down. While this report gave him a new direction to investigate the exact nature of Naruto's semblance, there was little he could do to capitalize on the new information immediately. With some slight hesitation, Ashbin picked up the second report and began to read through it for a second time. 
This particular report detailed the results of the analysis of the sample of Uzumaki Naruto's blood that had been recovered from the arena after the placement fights. The sample had been run through a DNA analysis, a test to determine any unusual compounds it contained, and a few other tests before it had been exhausted. The first part of the report was the DNA analysis, and it was utterly unique. Several of the tests in the DNA analysis were designed to identify known and unknown alleles in the subject's genetic code. The Vale Medical Database, which Oshpin had access to as the headmaster of Beacon, seeing as medical issues were common among hunters in training, had a massive list of every allele that had ever been discovered in a human or faunus's DNA. Every person who had ever undergone DNA analysis had at least a few alleles that weren't in the database. This was the result of mutations that happened constantly as cells divided and people reproduced. Most people had more than just a few. As many as 30 unknown alleles wasn't unheard of. Uzumaki Naruto, however, had 173 alleles that were previously unknown. 96 of these alleles appeared to serve the same purpose as a multitude of other alleles already in the database, albeit in a slightly different way. The other 77 were a mystery to the medical professionals. They had absolutely no idea what their purpose was, or if they had any significant effects at all. The compound analysis done on the blood only served to make things even more enigmatic. There were several substances in Naruto's blood that the report had failed to identify. The report stated clearly that the professionals who analyzed the compounds had not even a single clue as to what purpose they served, or if they were necessary for Naruto to be able to function. The report also mentioned that it was likely that these substances were produced naturally by Naruto's body, and noted that an explanation of why this conclusion was drawn would be given in the later bloodwork reports. Ashbin turned the pages to this report now, and began to read the most interesting part of the entire bundle. Preliminary checks had failed to identify Naruto's blood type, and the later tests revealed that Naruto had a completely unique protein tag on all of the cells in his blood. Completely baffled, the doctor that had run the test declared that Naruto, rather than being an A, B, or O blood type, would have to occupy a new category, blood type C. In addition to this, the test had determined that Naruto's concentration of white blood cells was about four times as high as the average person's. The report continued by saying that this, combined with his unique blood type, meant that any foreign organic matter entering his bloodstream would be utterly demolished, and it was likely that if any of Naruto's blood were to enter another person's system, it would do some serious damage. This was also what led them to believe that all of the unknown compounds were produced naturally within Naruto. Anything foreign would likely have been attacked and destroyed by his immune system. Aside from making blood transfusions involving Naruto an extremely foolhardy prospect, this report, when taken with all of the other reports and information about him, meant that Naruto wasn't quite human. He wasn't even a faunus either. Plenty of faunus DNA had made its way into Vale's database over the years, and none of it came even close to having the kind of radical differences that Naruto's did. Ashbin set the report back down and heaved a deep sigh. Even with all of this information, he really couldn't do much more than he already had been doing, watching and waiting. He couldn't very well walk up to Naruto and accuse him of not being human, and so far, the young man had been nothing but an asset to Beacon Academy. Attempting to get answers from Naruto himself carried potential risks as well. Naruto had appeared virtually out of nowhere, but he didn't just spring into existence. To appear out of nowhere like that, he had to have disappeared from somewhere else. Ashbin didn't want to risk him disappearing again. Even if Ashbin could say for certain that Naruto was a threat, which he definitely couldn't, it would be better to keep Naruto where he could be observed, rather than letting him fade into anonymity. Having decided that there wasn't anything he could do immediately when it came to those two reports, Ashbin picked up his scroll and slipped a data strip into the port on the side. A prompt came up on the screen, and he pressed the button that said, Play. A young girl's voice played from the scroll, shouting YNG. Immediately afterward, a second voice cried out, Kenjutsu. Taju Kaga Bunshin. Following that declaration, a strange sound echoed a multitude of times, and the recording ended. Ashbin decided that this recording could wait until the weekend, since Professor Lingwam had classes to worry about as well. After all, it wasn't as if translating a single phrase could gain him much new information. During the few days after Naruto's explanation of Kenjutsu's, there was a change in the dynamics of Team Ruby. Ruby was her usual energetic self, but Blake, Yang, and Naruto were all acting noticeably different. Yang was no longer looking for excuses to keep a teammate or two in between her and Naruto, nor did she glare at him whenever she looked at him. She was actually being polite, and had started to get back into the habit of subjecting him to some friendly teasing. The very day after their adventure in the Emerald Forest, Yang had sat down next to Naruto at breakfast, which surprised him a little, given her previous attitude toward him. 
When he commented on this later on to Blake, while they were waiting for a class to start, she gave him a slightly incredulous look. You basically showed us yesterday that risking your own life for one of us is no big deal to you. All Yang wanted really was proof that you cared about this team as much as the rest of us do. I think that putting yourself in mortal danger qualifies. Naruto really couldn't argue with that. Blake, while returning to being polite but distant, rather than distant and vaguely disapproving, seemed to take as many opportunities in between classes to go off on her own, checking out books from the library and doing an unusual amount of research. Ruby mentioned that she saw several books on aura and semblance in Blake's stacks of research material, but the others thought nothing of it. She's probably just reading them for fun or something. Knowing her, Young commented. After all, our room is pretty much her own personal library now. Yang's words were true. Blake had commandeered any and all spare shelf space from her teammates very early on to get as many books into the room as possible. The other three didn't really use their bookshelves for anything important, so they were happy to give their teammate the extra space. The changes that occurred in Naruto were more subtle. During the first week of classes, Naruto had never gone anywhere without a weapon, even if it was only one of his chakra kanai. Most of the time, he had kept his thigh pouch with him, fully stocked and ready for battle. Beyond that, he was always making sure that he was aware of his surroundings, often sitting with his back to a wall, and checking behind him often when he wasn't. These were ingrained habits that were a part of taking missions as a shinobi. Now, however, he was going around unarmed occasionally, and minimally armed far more frequently. He didn't take as much care as to where he was sitting while the rest of his team was around, and had stopped checking his surroundings most of the time. While his teammates didn't notice these specific changes consciously, they all thought that Naruto seemed more relaxed than he had before. It was during lunch between their classes, when all of Team Ruby could eat together, that Ruby ended up learning the reason behind Naruto's seemingly relaxed attitude. As she was walking to the cafeteria to meet up with Naruto, Blake, and Yang, she ended up encountering Professor Ashpin, who had been walking past the cafeteria at that moment. Hello, Professor, Ruby said. Ashpin smiled at her. Hello, Miss Rose. Tell me, how did your first week at Beacon go? Ruby blinked in surprise. Wow, has it really only been a week and a half? It seems like a lot longer than that. Indeed, Ashpin agreed. It was only last Monday the semester started, and yet I myself feel like I've had to work through a month's worth of issues. He sipped his coffee. Tell me, Miss Rose, how have things been with your team? Oh, they've been great. Well, we had some problems last week, but we worked through them. I guess it would have been too much to ask for a team of four random people to get together without any trouble, Ruby said. Ashpin nodded. Yes, it is quite rare for a team to form without some form of conflict early on. I'm glad to hear that it was resolved so well. He looked into the cafeteria to see that the rest of Ruby's team was already inside. Looking around the room, most likely they were searching for Ruby. I'm particularly glad that Mr. Uzumaki seems to have settled in so well with your team. There was always the risk that he would be a bit of a loose cannon. A loose cannon? Ruby asked. What do you mean by that, sir? There was a pause as Ashbin took a sip from his coffee. Has he told you much about his background, Miss Rose? Ruby didn't answer for a second, surprised by the question. Uh, not much at all. Actually, us digging into his past is kind of where those issues with the team started. Yes, I suspected that might have played some role, Ashbin admitted. I will admit, even I know precious little about him, much less than any other student I've allowed into Beacon. Most of my information about him is only suspicions, hunches, and guesses as well. What? But I thought that students had to go through years of combat school to get into Beacon. You'd have the teachers and students from there to ask about him, right? Ashbin shook his head. His admission, much like yours, came early and because of unique circumstances. He did spend three years at Signal, but during that time he barely interacted with anyone else from what I can tell. Before that, he simply appeared in Vale with no previous records of his existence anywhere. He paused to sip his coffee. It has been a struggle to find out anything about him at all. Ruby looked at Ashbin with no small amount of surprise. He just popped up in Vale? Out of nowhere? How is that even possible? Once again, I only have hunches and guesswork to go on. However, based on what I do know for sure, I can almost guarantee that he grew up outside of the protection of the Four Kingdoms, Ashbin said. When you look at his fighting prowess, it seems even more likely. Those who choose or are forced to live in the wilds of Remnant live or die by their swords. It is rare for someone so young to be able to make it to one of the kingdoms, but when they do, they are almost always prodigies of combat. It took Ruby a second to process all of this, and then a question popped into her head. Do they start training people earlier out in the wilds? Like, 
Years before they should start at Signal or Sanctum? Ashbin looked at Ruby now with a great deal of interest. Yes, almost any warrior in the wilds starts their training by the time they're 11. Some even start as early as 9 years old, and their training is usually more intense than what one of the lower academies would put a student through. Part of me is saddened by the fact that they are practically raising child soldiers. The rest of me realizes the reality that if they didn't do this, they would likely not survive. Ashbin paused for a moment, considering something, before saying, Did Mr. Uzumaki mention starting his training early? With a nod, Ruby said, He said, Well, he mentioned a place called Kona or something. I can't really pronounce the whole thing. And he said that he started training when he was six. Then he was avoiding us for a while. Ruby didn't see the look of surprise briefly flit across Ashbin's face before he regained a neutral expression. I see. Then I am very glad that he has begun to trust the three of you. Those who start training so young run the risk of losing themselves unless they can find something worth fighting for. You think Naruto trusts us? Ruby asked. I don't know about that. He doesn't really tell us all that much about him. He does trust you, Ashbin insisted. I've seen people like him before. People who come from the wilds and settle into one of the kingdoms. When he first chose to walk through the halls and rooms of this academy, he was quite cautious. He carried weapons with him when others would be unarmed and relaxed. He was always searching the area around him for threats. This is how he would have been trained to live. With no one else to watch your back, you must watch it yourself. Now, however, he leaves his weapons behind when he walks with Team Ruby. He sits with his back to a filled room without so much as a cautious glance behind him. He doesn't feel the need to watch his own back anymore because he knows that Team Ruby will watch it for him, just as he will strive to protect the three of you. That kind of trust is not given lightly. With those words, Ashbin turned away from the doorway and began to walk down the hall. Ruby stayed where she was for a moment, watching the rest of her team interact with each other. After another moment, she moved forward to join them. She didn't even think to ask why Ashbin had kept a close enough eye on Naruto to notice those things about him. Ashbin, meanwhile, was thinking over the implications of the new information he had just received so unexpectedly. On Wednesday of that week, Ruby decided to call another team training session, hoping that Team Ruby could be productive again now that intra-team tensions were pretty much gone. Her prediction proved to be correct, and the practice session went so well that she decided that another one on Thursday and a third on Friday were also a good idea. During the Wednesday session, the last of the mini team names were finalized, adding Team Nightingale, which consisted of Naruto and Blake, and the sister squad for Yang and Ruby. Yang had, once again, come up with both team names. Originally, she had suggested Knight and Gust for Blake and Naruto, due to Blake's favorite color and Naruto's favorite type of attack, but then her pun radar pinged, and she realized that she could change Gust to Gale. From there, she decided that it would be amusing to name their mini team after a bird. Naruto thought it was funny, and Blake didn't care enough to protest, so the name stuck. Thursday's practice session ended up being slightly different than the previous ones. Since all four of them had a bit of a busy schedule that day, they decided to meet up at the training ground, rather than gathering at the dorm room and going down together. After her last class was over, Ruby decided to head over to the training ground immediately, even though she would end up arriving almost 20 minutes early. At the very least, she figured could get warmed up while she waited for her teammates. When she arrived at the training ground, however, she found that she was not the first member of Team Ruby to get there. Naruto was sitting on top of a pillar made of stone, several leaves floating above and around his head. He didn't seem to notice Ruby's approach as she walked up to the side of the pillar and looked up at him. However, when she spoke, he gave no sign of being surprised. Naruto, what are you doing? He turned to look at her and smiled. Oh, just waiting until the rest of the team gets here. He jumped down from the pillar, and the sudden motion caused the leaves to scatter and blow away in the breeze. Actually, I'm glad you got here early too. There's something I wanted to discuss with you. Ruby was tempted to forestall his line of discussion to inquire about the leaves that were surrounding his head just a few seconds before, but decided that as a leader, it was her duty first and foremost to listen to the concerns of her teammates. Okay, what did you want to talk about? Well, I was thinking about today's training session, Naruto began. I was thinking that we could set some time aside for a little bit of a special exercise. You see, I have a certain technique that can really limit an opponent's ability to think clearly, but it can also affect others near my actual target. So, I figured that today I could get Blake, Yong, and you to build up some resistance to it. That way, it wouldn't affect you if I use that technique in the middle of a battle. Ruby nodded. That sounds like a good idea. How would we become resistant to it? Naruto smiled awkwardly and rubbed the back of his neck. Well, 
I would have to use it on you until you got used to it. It took a second for Ruby's brain to process that statement, and another few seconds for her to suppress her instinctive urge to abandon the idea immediately. The first thing that popped into her mind when Naruto mentioned his techniques was the massive inferno that turned a nevermore into ash, and that wasn't the kind of thing she wanted to be subjected to. Uh, this technique won't actually hurt any of us, will it? No, not at all. Naruto quickly reassured her. It's not even a physical attack. It's more of a well. It's like... It's kind of hard to explain, actually. He brought his fist up to his chin and pressed the knuckle of his index finger against his lips as he thought. Maybe it would be better if I explained it once Blake and Yang got here. Then I would only have to explain it once, and it would give me some time to think of how to explain what it is. Despite her now burning curiosity, Ruby couldn't deny that it was a good plan. Sure, that's fine. Unfortunately for her earlier point of curiosity, the short discussion that the two of them had 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 driven the thought of the floating leaves out of her mind. It wasn't long before Young and Blake arrived at the training arena as well. They did several one-on-one -on -one and two-on-two -on -two fights, as they had done in the past, and after about an hour and a half of practice, Ruby called a stop. Okay, everyone, good job so far. Now, we're going to be doing something a little different. Naruto, will you explain the technique thingy? Naruto nodded and replied with a level of seriousness that sharply contrasted his leader's reference to K.I. as a thingy. Of course, Taicho. I have a technique which I haven't used with all of you around so far that has the potential to affect you even if I direct it at an opponent that we're fighting. I thought that it would be a good idea for you to build up a resistance to it, and Ruby agreed to spend some time on it. I'll have to use the technique on the three of you for that to work, but don't worry. It doesn't do any physical damage and has no permanent effects. What's this technique called? Blake asked. Hmm. Killing intent? Naruto replied sheepishly. His three teammates took that information much better than he expected them to. Instead of the suspicion and interrogation about it he expected, they simply seemed wary. Okay, before you start using us as human targets, want to explain what exactly that is? Young asked. Naruto was relieved enough by their reactions that he didn't mind giving a more detailed explanation than he usually did. Killing intent, or KI for short, is a manifestation of my will and ability to do someone harm. When I project it outwards, it creates massive amounts of fear in a target and can cause them to freeze up or faint. It's called killing intent because when you actually intend to kill someone, it's much stronger. Anger also amplifies it, and it can affect everyone in the area of a target if I use enough. You can get used to it though, which is why we're here. You'll be able to build up a resistance to any KI you may encounter, and you'll get used to my particular KI much faster. Oh, Ruby said. That doesn't sound so bad. Yeah, young agreed. We're huntresses, whiskers. We're not a bunch of scaredy cats you can intimidate all willy-nilly. Blake remained silent, since she wasn't sure she wanted to commit to an opinion about killing intent just yet. On one hand, it did sound fairly simple to work past. Yet, Naruto had decided that it was important that they train themselves to resist it, and Naruto didn't seem like the type to exaggerate. Naruto smirked at Yang and Ruby. Oh, really? Well. Just so you know, I won my first match last Friday using KI alone. Made Russell pass out without moving a muscle. Young Scoffet. She had seen Russell in action and knew that he was pretty much a sissy. Yeah, somehow I doubt that was all that big of an achievement. Naruto secretly agreed with her, but decided that admitting that would only be counterproductive. Instead, he said, I bet that I could take all three of you on with nothing but my weapons and KI, and I would win. Now Ruby was beginning to think more like Blake and remained quiet. But Yang wasn't one to back down from a challenge like that. Just you versus the three of us, without any of your fancy jutsu crap? No way in hell could you manage that, whiskers. Is that so? Well, how about you prove it then? Naruto said. Oh, it is so on, whiskers. Blake and Ruby looked at the smile on Naruto's face, and then at each other. They could both tell what the other was thinking, since they were both thinking the same thing. I've got a bad feeling about this. Naruto stood in the center of the practice field. He had given his teammates complete freedom over where they would start from, and they had chosen to be spaced out evenly around him, near the edges of the arena. Once again, they had loaded their weapons with practice rounds, and the shielding on their weapons was in place. Ruby and Blake were slightly cautious about the coming fight, but Yang was impatient to begin. Come on, whiskers. You ready yet? But the end, Yang, Naruto repliet. Just give me a moment more. Naruto was doing some quick mental preparations in order to be able to use his killing intent on his teammates. It would be difficult for him to direct KI against them, 
since he instinctively knew them to be allies and friends. After a few more seconds, he felt that he was ready, and called out, All right, attack whenever you're ready. For Yang, this meant immediately. She charged directly at him. Ruby, after seeing her sister charge in a little recklessly, decided to charge as well to give her back up. Blake approached more slowly, getting into a better position, but also waiting and watching to see what the effects of Naruto's killing intent would be. When Yang and Ruby got close enough, Naruto drew Kitsu no Akari and slashed at Yang, who blocked with Ember Celica and went to punch him. Naruto spun past the punch, smacking Yang's arm away from him, and blocked an attack from Ruby. Kitsu no Akari and Crescent Rose ended up locked together. Yang, seeing an excellent chance, charged toward Naruto. All she had to do was draw her fist back and run. Yang nearly froze as an intense urge to flee took her. She just knew somehow that if she kept going toward Naruto, she would be killed. He would have no mercy upon her and tear her limb from limb. She fell backwards, landing on her but with an outcry of fear, and scrambled away from Naruto as quickly as she could. Her entire body was shaking as she turned herself around and pushed herself up off of the ground. Blake watched with wide eyes as Yang began to flee, but it wasn't long before the blonde brawler regained control of herself. Yang had only taken two steps when she froze again, and turned back toward Naruto, a look of confusion passing across her face before her expression settled into realization. Ruby, who had been distracted by Yang's cry, had been knocked back by a strong kick from Naruto. Blake decided that this was as good a time as any to try an attack of her own. She began to move toward Naruto, readying Gamble Shroud. As she approached Naruto, his head turned toward her, and they locked eyes. Blake suddenly stopped, frozen stiff, as sheer terror overcame her. She couldn't look away from Naruto's intense gaze. Those eyes, which were normally so warm and reassuring, were now hard and unforgiving. Blake knew at that point that she was in the presence of an apex predator, the ultimate killing machine. Even worse, it was displeased with her. She couldn't fathom what she had done to draw such ire from it, but her instincts were screaming at her telling her that her only hope was to prostrate herself before this predator that wore the face of her friend and beg for its forgiveness. She fell to her knees, dropping Gamble Shroud as she did so, as a vision of her own death flashed before her eyes. Suddenly, a sharp pain in her stomach replaced the terror she had been feeling, and she felt herself being flung backwards by some force whose source she couldn't identify. In the moment that she landed, she realized that Naruto had ran forward and punched her. With quivering hands, she pushed herself up off of the ground to see Naruto pick up Gamble Shroud and begin to fire it at Yang, who had apparently recovered from what must have been Naruto's killing intent. Naruto was forced to change tactics as Ruby entered the fight. He threw Gamble Shroud at her, which distracted her long enough for him to ready Kitsu no Akari and take a swing at Yang, who jumped backwards to avoid the attack. Ruby spared a moment to glance at Blake, who was still shaking like a leaf as she picked herself up from the ground before refocusing on the ongoing exchange between Yang and Naruto. Naruto had actually sheathed Kitsu no Akari and was fighting Yang hand to hand. Normally, this would be a situation that Yang would be getting the better of him in, but her hands were still quivering slightly and she was being more defensive than she normally would be in a fight. She spent more time blocking Naruto's attacks and retreating than actually punching him back and it was not going well for her. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, Yang flinched and jumped backward to put some distance between her and Naruto, the quivering in her arms becoming more pronounced for a moment, and Naruto took the opportunity to throw a few shuriken at her. At this point, Ruby began running toward Naruto to help Yang out. However, those shuriken hadn't been meant to hit Yang directly. Instead, they went wide of her before looping back around and spinning smaller and smaller circles around Yang, whose arms were quickly bound to her sides by ninja wire. Naruto drew Kitsu no Akari and turned toward Ruby after he was sure that Yang would be sufficiently hindered and had to bat away a swipe from Crescent Rose. Ruby kept moving forward, trying to give Blake a chance to retrieve Gamble Shroud and Yang a chance to untangle herself. She attacked with dizzying combinations and powerful swings, forcing Naruto to give ground before her. She began to smile as she considered the possibility that she could end the fight before Yang and Blake even needed to assist her. After all, Naruto had promised not to use jutsus for the fight. The smile quickly fell from her face as she felt the most intense fear she had ever experienced in her life. She drew Crescent Rose back toward herself in a defensive stance instinctively and backpedaled twice as fast as Naruto had been retreating while she had been fighting him. If she didn't get away from Naruto, she somehow knew that she would be seriously injured, or worse. An image of the Rasengan flashed through her mind. 
how it ground through bark and would like it wasn't even there. Naruto had the power to cripple her on a whim. What was she thinking, fighting him? A tiny voice in the back of her head spoke up, saying that Naruto had promised not to use Jutsus against them, and that even if he hadn't, he would never hurt her like that. But that voice was quickly crushed under another wave of mind-numbing terror. Then, just as quickly as the fear had come upon her, it vanished. She blinked and looked around the field, seeing that Blake had Gamble Shroud in her hand once more, and that Yang was detangling herself from the last of the ninja wire. She took a deep, shaky breath to calm herself, and then looked back toward Naruto. His face was expressionless as he stood with Kitsune no Akari ready in his hands. His eyes seemed slightly unfocused, and he didn't seem to be looking at anything in particular. However, that did not change the fact that he was ready to move at a moment's notice. Ruby thought that it was strange that he hadn't taken the opportunity to attack while she had been retreating, but decided that she had other things to worry about. For example, what to do now? Ruby, Yong, and Blake looked at each other, and in silent agreement, they all turned toward Naruto and charged simultaneously. Perhaps they thought that by attacking all at once, they could defeat Naruto before he had a chance to use his killing intent against them. Maybe they thought that they were now ready for his KI and could attack without worrying about it anymore. They might have even come to the conclusion that he could only focus it on one person at a time. Whatever they thought, it didn't stop their attack from failing completely. The instant they all began to attack Naruto, that overwhelming terror returned. It wasn't as strong as it had been before, so they were all able to continue to fight him, but they became sloppy and undisciplined. They would flinch away when Naruto made aggressive motions in their direction, and their shaking limbs made any attacks they did attempt far weaker than they would be normally. As time passed, the shaking in their limbs lessened slightly, and the fear began to become less intense, but they didn't notice these slight details as they fought as if their lives depended on it. They continued to fight for nearly 20 minutes before Naruto began to finish them off. Yang was knocked unconscious with the end of Kitsune no Akari, a nasty bruise forming on her forehead. Blake was tied up in ninja wire much like Yang was, only her entire body was bound, so there was no way she could get out. Finally, Naruto flared a particularly nasty spike of Kai at Ruby when they locked eyes, and she froze for a moment. For some reason, Naruto flinched as if he had been hit, and the terror that Ruby felt dropped dramatically. However, it didn't matter. He had already been moving forward as he flinched, and his left hand closed around the shaft of Crescent Rose, his right hand bringing the blade of Kitsune no Akari to rest against the side of Ruby's neck. Ruby met Naruto's eyes for a second time as the fear disappeared completely, and said, Looks like you win, Naruto. Good job. Naruto simply nodded and released her, sheathing Kitsune no Akari as he did so. For some reason, there was a sad look in his eyes for a moment before it was replaced with a smile and he said, Thanks. You didn't do too bad yourself for your first time facing Kai. With a smile of her own, Ruby looked over at Yang and Blake. The smile faded slightly as she looked at her still unconscious sister. Ooh, she's not going to be happy when she wakes up. She looked at Naruto and said, Sorry, but you're on your own when she comes after you for that. He nodded, having resigned himself to his fate from the moment he had struck Yang to begin with. Ten minutes later, Naruto was rubbing a lump forming on his head, and Yang had calmed down enough to admit that killing intent was far more formidable than she had given it credit for. They practiced two more times in the same manner as the first, and Yang, Blake, and Ruby were able to barely beat Naruto on the third try. It took Yang flaring her semblance, ridding herself of the fear from Naruto's KI, to put him on the defensive, and Ruby managed to hit him directly into Blake's ribbons, with which Blake quickly wrapped Naruto up. An immediate and massive flare of KI caused them to nearly abandon Naruto to allow him to escape, but all three of them managed to suppress the urge and keep him restrained. For a second time, Naruto met Ruby's eyes as he applied his KI. He didn't flinch that time, but he quickly averted his gaze from her, looking down almost shamefully. Once he had surrendered and been untied, he congratulated his three teammates. You've definitely begun to build up a significant resistance to killing intent. Good job. I think it would be a good idea for us to end the practice session here. He looked over at Ruby. I know we usually practice for an hour or so longer than we have today, but you three probably need some rest after what I, well, after what you've gone through. He looked slightly sad for a moment as he said that, but he quickly schooled his expression into an approving smile. Yang and Blake readily agreed to that, and once Ruby had nodded to them, they began to walk back to the dorms. Ruby took a step or two in the same direction, before realizing that Naruto had not moved at all. She stopped and looked at him. 
Are you not coming back with us, Naruto? This seemed to shake Naruto out of some deep thoughts. What? Oh, no, I'm coming back with you. I was just thinking about something. Sorry if I got a little distracted. He began to walk after Blake and Yong, who were far ahead of Ruby and him by now. Ruby fell into step beside him. She remembered how he had reacted when they had locked gazes in the arena and became concerned about his strange behavior. Hey, Naruto, is everything all right with you? Naruto gave Ruby a sidelong look of surprise and replied, Yeah, everything's fine. Why do you ask? Well, it's just, you were acting kind of weird just now, and when I looked at you while we were fighting, you were acting kind of weird too. I just wondered if something was bothering you. It took Naruto a second to realize what Ruby was talking about, and another second or so for him to reply. Don't worry about it, Ruby. It's nothing major. Ruby looked at him uncertainly. Are you sure? If something is wrong, I want to help. That's what a leader is supposed to do, right? Yeah, I suppose so. Naruto was silent for another few seconds before saying, it's just, using killing intent isn't as easy when you're, when it's a friend you're trying to use it on. Although she wasn't sure what that had to do with Naruto's odd behavior, she was happy that he was confiding in her. How so? The key word of killing intent is intent, he explained, looking straight ahead. I would never intentionally hurt the three of you. So in order to use enough of my KI to really have an effect on you, I had to forget who you were, in a way. I didn't focus on your faces if I could help it, and I dredged up as many memories that made me angry as I could. Not that that's too difficult, he mused to himself. When we made eye contact, well, your eyes are really unique. I've never seen such a pretty eye color anywhere else. Ruby blushed at these words and smiled. But Naruto wasn't done. Looking into your eyes reminded me just who I was fighting, and the way you were looking at me. I, it hurts to have someone you care about look at you like that, you know? Like you're a monster. Happiness and sadness warred inside of Ruby. Naruto had just admitted that he cared about her, but he was hurting inside, and she couldn't help but be sad with him. You're not a monster, she insisted. You're an awesome huntsman and the best teammate I could have. If training us to resist KI is going to do that to you, then we won't do it anymore, okay? Naruto looked over at Ruby, looking slightly surprised at her words. After a second, he smiled, and his whole face lit up. Ruby could tell that this wasn't the kind of smile that he would put up to hide pain. It was warm and genuine, and it made her heart flutter for a moment. Thank you, Ruby. It's nice to be able to talk about stuff like this instead of keeping it to myself like I used to, but I don't think we need to stop the training completely. The sparring with K.I. was more to prove a point to Yang than anything else. From here on out, I can just close my eyes and saturate the whole arena with K.I. Honestly, that's probably a better way to do it anyway, since that's the way my K.I. is likely to affect you in battle anyway. Well, if you're sure about it, I guess we can do more K.I. training, Ruby said. Although, I'm not exactly eager to do it again. I didn't know I could get that scared. Yeah, the first time experiencing K.I. is a bit rough, Naruto said sympathetically. Don't worry though. I can almost guarantee that my KI is the most intense in all of Remnant. If you can get used to mine, you'll be pretty much immune to anyone else who would be able to use it. Curiosity rose up in Ruby. Why is your KI so much more potent than anyone else's? Naruto's smile faded slightly, and Ruby started to slightly regret asking that question. Remember that special condition I have that I mentioned during initiation? Naruto asked her. It took Ruby a moment to remember what he was talking about, but then she nodded. Yeah, you said it was why you could do more jutsus without hurting yourself than most people could, right? She tried to think about the fact that Naruto's jutsus could kill him as little as possible. Yeah, I did, Naruto confirmed. It basically makes any technique I can do stronger than it should be. That includes KI. Ruby was silent for a moment before saying, What exactly is that special condition you have? You never actually explained what it was. Naruto's smile disappeared completely and Ruby immediately regretted asking. I don't want to talk about it, he said with a tone of finality. I'm sorry, Ruby said quickly. I shouldn't be prying into your personal business like that. Man, I'm such a dork. It's okay, Naruto said, giving Ruby a slight smile. Unlike his previous smile, there was a hint of sadness to it. You're not a dork, you're just curious. I don't mind you asking a few questions, honestly. It's just, there are some things I'm just not willing to talk about for now. As he finished saying this, they rounded a corner to see Blake and Young opening the door to their room. The four of them went in, and then quickly got to the serious business of calling and contesting dibs on the bathroom. Once all of them had showered and gotten into more comfortable clothing and began to lounge about the room, Young decided to comment. 
I guess I shouldn't have taken that killing intent stuff so lightly. Please tell me we don't have to go through that again anytime soon. Naruto chuckled. That's up to Ruby Taicho. Don't worry though. KI is always much worse your first time experiencing it. Trust me, I sympathize with you. So your sensei put you through this training as well? Blake asked. Well, not exactly, Naruto said. Blake shut her book and looked over at him. What does that mean? You had to have been put through some training for it, right? Naruto shrugged. I don't know if he was planning to put us through training for it or not, but it kind of became a moot point. How did that happen? Yang asked. My old squad and I kind of came across some high-level killing intent while out on a mission, Naruto admitted. We had to improvise, and after that, it would have been kind of pointless to do training for it. His teammates looked slightly surprised by that. Blake leaned forward slightly and asked, How exactly did you encounter KI like that? And why was your squad out on a mission? I didn't think the lower academies sent their students out of the city for anything. She then remembered Naruto mentioning that he had lived in Kanoha. Oh. They did things differently in Kanoha, didn't they? Naruto simply nodded and began to explain. He decided that it would be best to tell some half-truths and vague information for the moment, rather than explain in detail about his home village. In Kanoha, at a certain point in our training, we were allowed to go out on easy, low-risk missions, under the supervision of an elite ninja sensei to keep us out of trouble. The person who hired us lied about the mission so that he could get it cheaper. It was supposed to be something our squad could handle fairly easily, but it turned out that there was a bounty out on his head, and a group of nuke neen looking to collect it. Blake's eyes widened. Missing ninja? Naruto nodded. Ninja who betrayed their villages and went rogue. The group that was after us was from Kirigakure no Sato, the village hidden in the mist. However, that particular village had a very unpleasant reputation. It was more commonly called Blood Mist Village. Ruby, Blake, and Young all felt a shiver go up their spines. The nuke Nin leading the group was a man called Zabuza Momochi. He also had a bad reputation and a nickname. They called him the Demon of the Hidden Mist, or the Demon of Blood Mist. That didn't help his teammates' misgivings at all. We ran into him, and my sensei fought against him. Eventually I had to jump in to help, along with a teammate of mine. Zabuza had KI about as strong as mine is now, and he put the full force of that KI against us. Suddenly, Naruto put a goofy smile on his face, and the tension abetted. We won in the end though, and we got Tazuna home safe. There was silence for a moment before Young spoke up. How exactly did that village get a nickname like Blood Mist Village? Naruto hesitated a moment, chewing on his bottom lip slightly. I'm not sure you want to know. Kirigakure had been considered extreme even among shinobi. The policies that they used to have would probably greatly unsettle the rest of Team Ruby. Come on, we're big girls, Young argued. You don't need to baby us. After a moment of consideration, Naruto decided that it was probably better to just tell them. After all, brutality wasn't unique to the elemental nations, and they would all have to hear about things like this eventually anyway. All right, but don't say I didn't warn you, he said. In Kiri, they had an academy that was run a little bit like Beacon is. At the start of a student's first year, they would be assigned a partner. Partners would work together in every aspect of their training. They would eat together, train together, get the same grades, and inevitably become good friends. Then, they would have the final exam. Here Naruto hesitated again, and Ruby said, Well, everyone has exams, right? Even we'll have to take an exam like that at Beacon. Naruto winced slightly. Not like this. Pray that you never have to take a test like this. For the final exam, the partners would be put into a training room, and they would have to fight to the death. The survivor would graduate and become a ninja. If neither would kill the other, the proctor would execute them both. Ruby gasped. Yang's jaw dropped, and Blake froze, eyes wide. Naruto could tell that the three of them were imagining being told to kill their partners in order to graduate, just as he had when Yang had first asked him about the nickname. Worst part is, Naruto continued, Kiri's academy was at the same level as Kanoha's academy. That means that the average graduation age was 12. That's horrible. Ruby exclaimed. How could someone, what kind of person thought up that test? Yang opened and closed her mouth a few times before she remembered how to speak. Damn, just that whole village. Please, Blake said softly. Please tell me that that exam doesn't happen anymore. Naruto shook his head. That exam hasn't happened in over 20 years. Kiri had some changes in leadership, and some other things happened that made the military reconsider the wisdom of cutting its forces by 50% immediately. Either way though, the name stuck. It was quiet for several minutes in Team Ruby's dorm room as none of them wanted to discuss the subject further. 
Blake went back to reading. Young started brushing her hair, just to have something to do, and Naruto pulled out some shuriken to sharpen. Ruby, however, simply sat there. A question that she wasn't sure she should ask on her mind. She was caught between fear and her curiosity. She couldn't bear not knowing the answer to her question, but at the same time, she was afraid of what that answer would be if she asked. After a while, curiosity won, and she spoke. Narchuo, did you ever have to take an exam like that? Everyone's eyes locked onto Ruby, surprise in their expressions. After a moment's pause, Naruto set down his shuriken and whetstone and answered. Not like Kiri's, no. Kanoha, despite everything else, they wouldn't have done something like that. Our final exam was a test of skill in the face of adversity. Three fresh jinin were pitted against the jonin, and we would have to fight until the jinin were defeated, or they completed whatever objective the jonin assigned them. If they passed the test, the jonin would become their sensei. Ruby's shoulders relaxed noticeably, and Blake and Yang were relieved as well, although they didn't display it so obviously. Blake decided to ask a question of her own now that the atmosphere was less tense. Low ninja and high ninja? Were those ranks in Kanoha? Yeah, Naruto answered. Although, rookie ninja and elite ninja are probably better translations. From lowest to highest rank, there were Jinin, Chunin, Tokubetsu Jonin, or Takujo for short, Jonin, and Unbu. Dark side? Blake asked. That doesn't sound like a usual name for a rank. Oh, sorry. It's an acronym. Although, dark side is pretty fitting. Unbu was a special division of the military. It wasn't an actual rank, but Unbu members had more authority than anyone but the Hokage, who was the strongest ninja and the military leader of the village. Unbu is short for Ansatsu Senjutsu Takushu Butai. They were the best of the best. Messing with a member of Unbu usually got you killed or imprisoned. Somehow, it didn't surprise Blake that Kanoha had a faction known as the Special Assassination Tactical Squad, and she didn't comment on it. Yang, however, had a question of her own. So, what were you, Whiskers? Let me guess, a kick-ass Junin? Naruto shook his head with a small smile. That's Jonin, Yang. And no, technically speaking, I'm still a Jinin. This surprised all three of his teammates, and Yang protested. No way. If you kicked our butts as a Jinin, then those Unbu guys would be ridiculous. Nobody in the world could possibly be that powerful. Blake and Ruby nodded in agreement, but Naruto just smirked. I said, technically, Yang. When I took my Chunin exam, Kanoha came under attack by a rival village, supported by the minor village Odoge Kuro no Sato. His smirk fell away, and he became somber. The Hokage was killed, and the resulting upheaval cut the exam short. Soon after that, I? I had to leave Kanoha permanently. By virtue of skill, I'm probably around Takujo level. Ruby noticed his change in mood at the mention of the Hokage's death. Were you close with the Hokage? She asked. Naruto nodded. He was well. I used to call him Ajikan Grandpa. He was the closest thing to family I had. There was silence for a moment before Naruto smiled and said, But now I've got you guys, yeah? He died an honorable death, protecting the village he loved. No reason to be sad anymore about it. That smile of his was infectious, and his statement that he had the three of them now warmed their hearts. Soon the entire team was smiling along with him. For the rest of the night, until they went to bed, they chatted and talked about other, happier things. All of them had had enough of shinobi matters for one day. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.